talking about the Wall Street protests. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Tuesday is May Day, May 1st, also known as International Workers' Day, a holiday that celebrates workers' rights and achievements of organized labor, such as the eight-hour workday. This year, the Occupy Wall Street campaign is hoping to mobilize tens of thousands of people across the country under the general slogan, General Strike, No Work, No Shopping, Occupy Everywhere. Events are planned in 125 cities. The Occupy campaign campaign plans to protest in 99 targets alone in Midtown Manhattan, including the offices of J.P. Morgan Chase and Bank of America. Activists gathered last Thursday in New York City's Union Square to announce plans for the massive May Day protests that will include immigrant groups, workers, unions, members of Occupy Wall Street. Chris Silvera, secretary general of Teamsters Local 808. We want the immigrant community. We want Teamsters. We want laborers. We want the RSDWU. We want the United Food and Commercial Workers. This is a day that should be represented by hundreds of thousands marching like they did in 1886. We have to turn back the clock on Mr. Romney, on Mr. Obama, on the Congress, on Mario Cuomo, on Bloomberg, and the 99 percent has to get their share. Well, to talk more about May Day and the Occupy campaign, we're joined by leading social theorist David Harvey, distinguished professor of anthropology at the Graduate Center of City University of New York. Uh, he has been teaching Karl Marx's Kapital for nearly 40 years, as the author of a number of books, including The Limits to Capital and A Brief History of Neoliberalism. His most recent book is called Rebel Cities, From the Right to the City to the Urban Revolution. Explain, David Harvey. Um, I'm trying to look at uh, the history of uh, urban uprisings. And actually, if you look at the situation around the world right now, you see examples in Bahrain, you see them in Cairo, you see them going on with the Indignados movement in, in Spain and, uh, of course, in Greece, and you see them in Chile. And in recent years, we've seen uprisings in places like Los Angeles 20 years ago. and. So uh, this, and, I, and I'm, I'm interested in the sort of political significance uh, of, of these movements, and I think in some ways Occupy Wall Street is in that in that tradition, and tomorrow's actions, which are going to be decentralised all over the city, uh, in a way, is saying let's take back the city and call it our city instead of being the city that belongs to the one percent. And so it's it's a bit like saying let's let's have our city and make it our city. And of course one of the Instances where that happened most uh, emphatically was back in the Paris Commune of uh, 1871, and so I, I, I wanted. What was the Paris Commune of 1871? The Paris Commune was a, was an uprising against uh, the government and an attempt to create uh, an alternative form of urban governance uh, in in Paris in 1871 under conditions of. Uh, war and, and the like, and of course it was ruthlessly uh, uh, suppressed, uh, as we see going on in Syria right now, in Homs and places, so that so these urban movements can sometimes work and sometimes they get savagely repressed. Moving forward from the Paris Commune, you talk about the right to the city. What does that mean? The right to the city means to, who has the right to New York City? Who, who, who can affect things here? Who can really change life here? And uh, when we talk about the power of the 1 percent, we're talking about an extremely powerful group that actually dominates much of, of investment in the city, much of rebuilding of the city. Uh, we have a billionaire mayor who allies with them. Um, but it's hardly a city that is run by picture the homeless or, or uh, the impoverished population. So in claiming the right, in reclaiming the right to the city, what we're really trying to talk about is the way in which ordinary people can affect urban life and, and, and define a different kind of urban environment in which they're going to live. Earlier this month, uh, New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg compared the city council's living wage bill to communism. Uh, the bill would raise workers' wages at city subsidized developments. Bloomberg made the comment in an interview on WOR Radio. If you think about it, um, it, the last time you really had a big managed economy was the USSR, and that didn't work out so well. Not so well. Um, you cannot stop the tides from coming in. We need jobs in the city. It would be great if all jobs in the city paid a lot of money uh, and had great benefits uh, for the workers. Uh, not good for the employers, but, we, but
But if you force that, you will just drive businesses out of the city. That was Mayor Bloomberg, yeah, David Harvey. That's the usual story. But look at, look at the situation. Uh, the top 1 percent in New York City earns um, on income tax returns earns something like $3.57 million a year. That's what the top 1 percent earns on average. There are 34,000 households, nearly 100,000 people who are trying to live in the city on $10,000 a year. Half of the population of New York City is trying to live on $30,000 a year. This is the, the, the levels of inequality in this city are absolutely stunning, and they've increased immensely uh, since the 1970s. And then when you say, who dominates urban life, who, who, who dominates the decisions, well, it's, it's, it's the 1 percent. And so I think what Occupy Wall Street and the rest is saying is that we only have one form of power, which is people on the streets. Uh, actions in the streets. We don't have the power to dominate the media. We don't have the power, the money power, to, to, to dominate uh, politics. And this is the situation we are in. So Occupy Wall Street is trying to give a different mode of political expression to politics as usual. Uh, the Occupy movement has in faced increasingly brutal police yeah. responses. Uh, in November, Democracy Now! spoke to Stephen Graham, who wrote Cities Under Siege, The New Military Urbanism, which yeah. looks at the increasing influence of military technology on domestic police forces. Well, there's been a long-standing shift in, in uh, North America and Europe towards uh, paramilitarized policing using helicopter-style systems, using um, infrared sensing, using really, really heavy uh, militarized weaponry. That's been long-standing, fueled by the, um, the war on drugs and, and, and other sort of explicit campaigns. But more recently, there's been a big push since the end of the Cold War um, by the big defense and security and IT companies to sell things like um, video surveillance systems, things like um, ge geographic mapping systems, and even more recently, drone systems that have been used in the assassination raids in, in Afghanistan and in Pakistan and elsewhere as a sort of domestic policing t technology. That's Stephen Grammer at Cities Under Siege, the new military mm -hmm. urbanism. Um, you know, we have a law, Posse Comitatus, that says soldiers can't march in the streets. But it seems the way authorities get around this is simply by militarizing the police, mm -hmm. Professor Harvey. Yes, this is a—but uh, I take this as a sign of how nervous the 1 percent is. Um, I, I mean, we've gone through this crisis, and effectively the 1 percent has done very well out of this crisis. Nobody's gone to jail for all of the things that uh, we know went wrong. Uh, and I think uh, the 1 percent is rather terrified that actually people will start listening to the rhetoric of Occupy Wall Street. And to some degree, uh, people already have, because the conversation has shifted a little bit towards the question of social inequality. And, and, and poverty. Um, and, and I think that uh, the, the, the repressive moves uh, of the police, uh, are not just simply in New York City, but uh, across, across the nation, it seems almost to be coordinated, uh, seems to me to be almost a direct line of instruction from, you know, the J.P. Morgans of this world and all of the rich folk to kind of say, you've got to keep these people quiet, you've got to squash it uh, in and the, the bus, in the bus. And, uh, all of and the, the police have, have been doing it. And I think uh, Occupy Wall Street. It's taking some inspiration, it seems to me, from the, the, the courage of the people in Tahrir Square or in Bahrain and the rest of it, to say, look, things have to change, and, 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 and we're going to try to, to make this change come about in a peaceful way. I mean, this is, again, one of the signal things that's about it. This is a peaceful form of demonstration, and it is being ruthlessly sometimes turned into a police riot. You talk about the creation of the urban commons. Yes. Well, the amazing thing about New York City, for example, is there are all these public spaces, but is there a public space where we can set up the, the equivalence of the Athenian Agora and have a, a political discussion? And the answer to that is no. You have to apply for, you know, all kinds of permits, and it's highly regulated. So the public space is not really open to the public. Uh, a lot of it is now, of course, turned into flower beds, and so we have a, a great place for the assemblage of tulips and, and so on, but we don't have a place where people can assemble. And so one of the things we're going to try to do tomorrow is to set up places of assembly where we can talk about things. So there's a sort of a free university in Madison Square Park, and I'm going to be participating in that, and then the many other actions of that kind, one, of, one aim of which is to try to liberate spaces in the city where we can have political discussions and where we can have open political dialogue.
You talk about the party of Wall Street meeting its nemesis. Well, I think uh, Occupy Wall Street has is, is has really been onto something. It's it struck a chord, and 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 the big and I talked about the repression of it, but and I think the the chord it struck is is is, is in effect measured by the speed and fierceness of of uh, of the repressive moves that have been taken. So I think it's it's beginning to be listened to, and I hope hope tomorrow that there'll be a situation in which many more people will say, look. Things have got to change. Something different has to happen. Finally, the art of rent. There is a big anti-foreclosure movement all over this country. Minneapolis, uh, right. there is a protest right now happening right. to prevent another foreclosure. Why do you refer to the art of rent? Well, one of the, one of the things that's happened is the attempt to turn cultural activities into industries to try to commodify history. So, and, and you get a sort of commodified form of history, and that uh, allows people to claim that this is a very unique uh, configuration. So there's an attempt to create something very, very special to which tourists are drawn, and then that gives you what I call monopoly rent, uh, that, uh, that, that, that the, the uniqueness of, of, of cultural configuration is being commodified. But as you, as you know, with, with, with environmental uh, right. commons and everything else, the tendency is for the uniqueness actually to be destroyed by commercialization. Professor David Harvey, thank you for joining us. We'll put thank part you. two on our website, Rebel Cities, from the right to the city to the urban.